Welcome to this presentation on the basis for the football power diet, which is bioenergetic nutrition for athletic performance. My name is Jay Feldman. I'm a health coach and independent health researcher, and I have degrees in neuroscience and exercise physiology from the University of Miami. I'm a part of the football supplements sports research team, and I'll be uh, going through this presentation with you. And just for reference, there are references for the different slides and points throughout this presentation. I'll be linking to all of those at the end. So let's begin by answering the question, what is the bioenergetic view of performance nutrition? So when it comes to the bioenergetic view, what we're discussing here is the ability to produce energy or ATP through efficient mitochondrial respiration with the knowledge that this is the primary determinant of our health and is a major driver of athletic performance and recovery. So when we're talking about the capacity to produce energy in terms of athletic performance and recovery, this is going to be something that's dramatically important, not only in the muscle tissue or muscle cells, as we're seeing here, where we're seeing the breakdown of primarily carbohydrate and fat in order to, to produce the ATP that's required for contractility, among other things. But this is also going to be particularly important in other tissues as well, whether that's the brain, you know, accounting for the uh, mental side of athletic performance, as well as the liver, which is an important aspect in terms of of the capacity for sustained performance in order to provide adequate glucose through processes like the Cori cycle and gluconeogenesis and on from there. But in either case, this is going to be our primary focus is how well we're able to produce energy from the substrate that's coming in with the knowledge that that's vitally important when it comes to athletic performance and recovery. And so we have quite a bit of evidence showing how important this is and that we know that low energy availability not only affects day-to-day -day performance, but also affects the capacity for sustained athletic performance over a career. And this is because low energy availability in athletes is associated with increased risk of bone injuries, reduced testosterone levels, increased cortisol levels, reduced T3 levels, and impaired recovery and performance. So this is going to be dramatically important when it comes to athletic performance and recovery. And with that in mind, maximizing energy availability through efficient mitochondrial respiration will support performance and recovery while reducing the risk of injury and other health issues. So this is going to be our primary focus here, which leads us to the next question, which is how do we then maximize performance from the bioenergetic view? And we're going to use a couple of different proxies in order to determine how different factors in our environment and different nutritional factors affect our energetic state. This is going to include thyroid status, sex hormone levels, and the uh, resting metabolic rate ratio. We'll be using those as proxies for the energetic state. And by identifying how aspects of nutrition and our environment affect the energetic state and the above proxies, we can determine how they will affect athletic performance. And therefore, we can provide the optimal nutrition and environment for athletic performance, recovery, and health. So that is going to be our focus here, is identifying the most important nutritional and environmental factors in terms of their effects on the energetic state. And this being the primary goal for improving athletic performance, recovery, and health. Now, when it comes to maximizing performance from the bioenergetic view, there are a few primary goals that we're going to be going over here, a few primary uh, directives. The first is going to be removing or reducing the foods that inhibit efficient energy production. The second is going to be providing adequate amounts of the foods and nutrients needed for efficient energy production. And lastly, we have the removal of other factors in our environment that inhibit efficient energy production. So those are the three primary things that we're going to be going over today, how we can accomplish each of those. We're going to start out with the first of those, which will be nutritional factors that inhibit efficient energy production. And within these, we have two categories. We have the anti-nutrients and we have the polyunsaturated fatty acids or PUFA. We'll start by digging into the anti-nutrients. So there are a handful of different anti-nutrients. These include lectins, phytates, oxalates, enzyme inhibitors, saponins, and goitrogens. And these are going to be, these are chemical compounds that are found in high concentrations in certain foods. And this includes whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, and raw leafy green vegetables. So we'll be talking about why these anti-nutrients provide problems and what types of foods we want to use in place or how we can adjust these foods in order to reduce the anti-nutrients. And along with this, we have a quote from a paper describing the 
uh, general biological role of these antinutrients. They state that lectins are present in a variety of plants, especially in seeds, where they serve as defense mechanisms against other plants and fungi. Because of their ability to bind to virtually all cell types and cause damage to several organs, lectins are widely recognized as antinutrients within food. Lectin activity has been demonstrated in wheat, rye, barley, oats, corn, and rice. However, the best studied of the cereal grain lectins is WGA, wheat germ and gluten. So that just goes uh, to support the, the problematic and defensive mechanisms that, uh, that these chemical compounds serve inside of plants. And we'll be digging into all of their physiological effects and why that actually provides uh, some evidence that we don't want to be consuming high concentrations of these antinutrients. And this is because antinutrients cause a handful of different physiological effects. First of these is intestinal permeability. Next, we have impaired macronutrient digestion and absorption. We also have impaired micronutrient absorption. We have bacterial uh, pathogenic bacterial proliferation. We have various harmful systemic effects, and we have endotoxin production. So we'll be digging into each of these in a bit more detail and also connecting those in with their effects, uh, direct effects on athletic performance recovery, both day to day and over a career. So we're going to start with the with a question here, which of course I'm sure many of you may be asking, which is shouldn't whole grains serve as the nutritional foundation? Of course, this is something that many of us have been taught uh, in school and, and you know various certifications and otherwise. But the, the idea that whole grains should be our nutritional foundation is based on support that really violates one of the most basic principles when it comes to science, which is that correlation does not equal causation. We have a couple of uh, quotes from a paper describing this. So they state that observational perspective and cross-sectional studies show that the intake of whole grain products is associated with reduced risks for developing type 2 diabetes, Cardio cardiovascular diseases, obesity, and some types of cancer. Inflammation is associated with these conditions, and some studies have shown that associations between the intake of whole grains and decreased inflammatory markers are found. Intervention studies, however, do not demonstrate a clear effect of the intake of whole grains on inflammation, and it could therefore be that other components in the diet modulate the immune response. They go on to say that it has been shown that the intake of whole grains is associated with with, healthy, with healthier dietary factors and a healthier lifestyle in general. In a Scandinavian cross-sectional study, the intake of whole grains was directly associated with the length of education, the intake of vegetables, fruits, dairy products, fish, shellfish, coffee, tea, and margarine, and inversely associated with smoking, BMI, and the intake of red meat, white bread, alcohol, cakes, and biscuits. Good quality epidemiological studies attempt to control for these confounding factors, but with the consequence that associations are attenuated or become insignificant. So what we're seeing here between these couple of quotes is that, yes, there is an observational correlation where it seems like the intake of whole grains is associated with certain benefits. However, when we look at intervention studies and we account for factors like the healthy user bias, that this actually nullifies those effects. And so we don't actually see that the whole grains are responsible for those benefits. And instead, as we'll be getting to in a moment or throughout this, this section, the whole grains can uh, pose quite a few problems. So the first of these is intestinal permeability, and we'll just first dig in with what is intestinal permeability. So intestinal permeability allows intestinal macromolecules, that means larger molecules, microbes, and microbial products to enter the bloodstream from the intestines. So these are things that we generally would not want to enter the bloodstream. And so on the left here, we see normal intestinal permeability where those larger uh, macromolecules, microbes, and microbial products are not able to enter the bloodstream. Whereas on the right, we see an intestinal permeable state where those larger molecules are able to enter into the bloodstream, and we'll discuss why that's such a problem. Now, the absorption of these macromolecules, microbes, and, mi and microbial products drives systemic inflammation. So this is one of the major reasons why this is a problem. And we have a good quote here that explains this stating that the intestinal barrier allows the uptake of nutrients and protects from damage of harmful substances from the gut lumen. Macromolecules that can be immunogenic, like proteins, large peptides, but also bacteria and lectins, can be endocytosed or phagocytosed by enterocytes forming the epithelial layer of the gut. Normally, only small amounts of antigens pass the barrier by, transocytos by transcytosis and interact with the innate and adaptive immune system situated in the lamina propria, when the barrier function is disrupted, 
there's an increased passage of dietary and microbial antigens interacting with the cells of the immune system. So what we have here is a description of this state of intestinal permeability and how this drives an inflammatory response. Now, of course, and we'll get to this in a little bit, some evidence showing what actually happens directly in athletes. But in general, when we're in a systemically inflamed state, that's not going to be ideal. Not only can we have the intestinal inflammation along with this, that's going to cause potentially GI symptoms, but also this is going to interfere with efficient mitochondrial respiration, as we'll discuss in a little bit. And that is something that's going to be dramatically harmful when it comes to performance and recovery. Now, as far as the anti-nutrients go, the lectins and saponins have been shown to cause intestinal permeability. And this, we have a couple of uh, quotes here to uh, explain this, corroborate this, and they state that in this first one, this suggests that together with gliadin, wheat germ gluten can increase intestinal permeability, resulting in an increase of translocating microbial and dietary antigens interacting with the cells of the immune system. And then in this next quote, they state that the results indicate that some subponents readily increase the permeability of the small intestinal mucosal cells, thereby inhibiting active nutrient transport and facilitating the uptake of materials to which the gut would normally be impermeable. So again, we see that these anti-nutrients are going to drive intestinal permeability, and we will be coming back to why this is so harmful in athletes in a little bit. Now, the next effect of the anti-nutrients is impaired macronutrient digestion and absorption. Now, we know that the lectins, phytates, and enzyme inhibitors inhibit digestive enzyme function, which then impairs macronutrient digestion and absorption. So this means that there's an impairment or reduction in the capacity to break down and absorb the macronutrients, this being mostly carbohydrates and protein, although potentially with fats as well. We have a couple of quotes here describing this. I'm just going to read uh, the bolded parts. Then this first quote, they state, thus, the well-established lectin-induced disruption of intestinal microvilli combined with the in vivo inhibitory effects on gut enzymes suggests that the lectins interfere either directly or indirectly, not only with the utilization of dietary protein and carbohydrate, but also with the initial and final stages of protein and carbohydrate digestion and transport. This next one, they state that, and again, I'll just read the uh, bolded part. They state that it has been reported that phytic acid can inhibit pepsin activity and alpha amylase activity in vitro. Phytic acid can also inhibit the proteolytic enzyme trypsin. So these are enzymes that break down protein, that's the pepsin and trypsin, and the am amylase is a uh, peptide or an enzyme that breaks down uh, carbohydrates, specifically starch. So this, of course, is going to affect the digestion of these different macronutrients. And then in this last uh, study, they state that poor digestibility of protein in the diets of developing countries, which are based on less refined cereals and grain legumes, as major sources of protein is due to the presence of less digestible protein fractions, high levels of insoluble fiber, and or high concentrations of anti-nutritional factors or anti-nutrients present endogenously or formed during processing. So what they're stating here is that the anti-nutrients in, in this case, they're talking about the whole grains or less refined grains and cereals and legumes is going to uh, lead to a situation where the protein is actually not well digestible. So what we have here is a situation where we're consuming amounts of carbohydrate and uh, and protein that are not being broken down and absorbed. So not only does this mean that we're not actually getting the nutrition that we're taking in, which is going to be uh, particularly problematic for an athlete that needs that to produce energy, needs that to refill glycogen, needs that for muscle protein synthesis. So that's going to be dramatically problematic. And then also we have undigested protein and carbohydrate that are then reaching bacteria in the intestine creating an inflammatory state there as well. So this is problematic on multiple fronts. Now, in addition to impaired macronutrient digestion and absorption, the anti-nutrients will also cause impaired micronutrient absorption. And more specifically, this will be the phytates and oxalates, which bind with minerals and prevent their absorption. A couple of quotes here. Again, I'll read the bolded parts. It has also been appreciated for some time that if phytates comprise a substantial part of the diet, greater than 1% or so, they can interfere with the bioavailability of elements such as zinc, calcium, magnesium, etc. In this next quote, they state that phytate was one of the strongest inhibitory predictors of calcium, iron, and zinc bioavailability. And lastly, oxalates like phytates bind minerals like calcium and magnesium and interfere with their metabolism. So in this case, we have a situation where we are not actually absorbing, or the athlete is not actually absorbing the nutrients, the micronutrients, the vitamins and minerals that are coming in. And this is, of course, a major problem. We need these minerals for hormone production. We need them for energy production. 
We need them for protein synthesis. We need them for bone density and on from there. So this is incredibly problematic, uh, especially when we consider, as we'll talk about later, that athletes actually have increased nutritional needs. So to have increased nutritional needs and not be absorbing the vitamins and minerals that come in is a major problem. Now, another effect of the anti-nutrients is pathogenic bacterial, bacterial proliferation. So this has been shown to be an effect of the lectins, which support the growth of pathogenic bacteria. And they state in this study that an additional secondary effect of undigested lectin, particularly PHA and the small intestine, which may further reduce the efficiency of digestion and absorption of food, is a dramatic overgrowth of coliform bacteria. In consequence, the increase in bacterial numbers in the small intestine may lead to overproduction of bacterial toxins, which also contributes to the worsening of animal health. And then in this next quote, PHA caused proliferation of a consistent adherent microbial flora in the jejunum. The predominant bacteria identified were E. coli, A. streptococcal, and lactobacillus. Now we'll come into we'll come back to some details as far as why the proliferation or growth of harmful or pathogenic bacteria is such a major problem. Of course, on its on its front, on its surface, it already sounds problematic. We don't want to be increasing the growth of pathogenic bacteria that cause illness which these lectins are able to do. But there are also some uh, very particular reasons why we don't want this to be happening in our athletes. So we'll be coming back to that in a moment. Before we do that, there are certain systemic effects that antinutrients have that are worth noting. The first is that goitrogens are able to inhibit thyroid production, thyroid hormone production, which lowers our metabolic rate and interferes with efficient mitochondrial respiration. So this is a major problem as the thyroid hormone is, or the active thyroid hormone especially, is the main determinant of the metabolic rate and of ATP production. So if we're not producing enough thyroid hormone, or if an athlete is not producing enough thyroid hormone, this is going to interfere with their capacity for energy production. That means the capacity for muscular contraction, the capacity for recovery, the capacity for building new muscle tissue, and on from there. So this is a major problem of the goitrogens. In addition, we have the fact that lectins cause direct impairments in insulin secretion and muscle protein synthesis along with glycogen depletion. Now, this might go without saying how impactful this could be on an athlete. We have a couple of quotes explaining this, and they state in this first one, reactive forms of the lectins are distributed in the circulation and internal tissues and may lead to deleterious systemic effects. They go on to say that PHA reduced the circulating levels of insulin initially by interfering with its secretion from the pancreas, but later, insulin synthesis was also impaired. They go on to state that some lectins induce body fat catabolism and glycogen loss, leading to the depletion of body reserves. And lastly, dietary PHA also alters the rate of muscle protein synthesis without significantly affecting the rate of protein degradation, resulting in loss of muscle weight. So again, this goes without saying that the depletion of glycogen, uh, impairment in muscle protein synthesis, leading to loss of muscle weight, and of course, also impairing the secretion and synthesis of insulin is incredibly problematic. We need that insulin not only to allow for the carbohydrate to enter into the muscles to be used to produce energy, but also for amino acids to do the same. And so we have a trifecta here of, of major problems when it comes to being able to maintain muscle mass as well as perform on a daily basis as a result of the lectins. Now we're going to come to uh, endotoxin and inflammation as an effect of the anti-nutrients, and here we'll be tying in a couple of these earlier uh, effects that we've been describing. Just to begin with what endotoxin is, endotoxin is also known as lipopolysaccharide, or LPS. It's a component of bacterial cell walls, specifically the gram-negative bacteria, which are a couple of the ones that we described earlier, or had talked about earlier when it came to the proliferation of harmful bacteria. And the lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin is also produced from these bacteria in addition to being a component of their cell wall. Now, endotoxin has a handful of different harmful effects when it comes to uh, interacting with human physiology. The first is that it causes an inflammatory response, which increases the secretion of inflammatory cytokines. This is cytokines like TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, uh, and, and on from there. In addition, endotoxin and these inflammatory cytokines that it increases the production of will then impair mitochondrial respiration. So they'll directly block the capacity for energy production, uh, and we'll get to that in a second. And then lastly, endotoxin and inflammatory cytokines, again, these, one, these ones that it will produce, uh, impair thyroid hormone production and conversion. So as we've talked about earlier, 
the thyroid hormone is the primary determinant of the metabolic rate. So this is going to lead to a situation of depression of that metabolic rate, which is the last thing that we want for an athlete. We have a couple of depictions here showing uh, endotoxin or lipopolysaccharides effects on mitochondrial respiration. We see that on the left here where the LPS at the top is increasing the production of certain cytokines. In this case, we have nitric oxide as one of those, and these are going to go ahead and impair the function of the electron transport chain. Endotoxin also has some direct effects there as well to impair the production of, of ATP as they're describing low ATP and low oxygen consumption as a result of the endotoxin. And we see this on the right as well. And the reason why I wanted to include this uh, diagram in particular is because we see things like decreased ATP production. And then we also see how this leads to a decrease in contractile function. We can see that over on the right there of that diagram. And of course, this is not what we want for an athlete that needs contractile function for their muscles to function and for them to perform. There are some other effects to consider as well when it comes to endotoxin and inflammation. And some of these have to do with direct effects in athletes. So elevated levels of endotoxin during exercise have been shown to cause GI distress, heat stress, cramping, impaired recovery, and long-term health consequences. And these are all in athletes. We have a few quotes here describing this. In the first, they state that LPS from gram-negative intestinal bacteria may provoke immune responses and endotoxin-associated symptoms characteristic of GI complaints often experienced in runners. They go on to say that when GI defenses are either disrupted, i.e. luminal damage from exercise, or LPS sensing is overloaded, the heightened inflammatory response may result, which could in part relate to GI symptoms associated with exercise. This could have implications to daily recovery mechanisms throughout prolonged training periods. And lastly, they state that the potential for exercise-related endotoxin-mediated cytokinemia may explain individual susceptibility to GI symptoms and recovery from endurance exercise. If prevalent, the presence of and repeated exposure to low-grade LPS, uh, and they give the ranges there, may promote a mild inflammatory state which could be detrimental to the long-term health of recreational athletes who regularly engage in exercise. So this is something that is being studied, and we'll go over a couple more studies in a second, but this is something that's being studied as a driver of these consequences in athletes during exercise. And this is not even considering the fact that our diet could be increasing the contribution of endotoxin to these effects. So a couple more quotes here that we'll go over. Increases in LPS were also positively correlated with the incidence of cramping in the lower limbs. Therefore, increased GI permeability and the subsequent rise in circulating LPS can exacerbate thermal strain by initiating an inflammatory cascade, perfusion abnormalities, and organ dysfunction. And lastly, it is now recognized, or there's actually one more quote, it is now recognized that inflammatory pathways can also contribute to heat illness in a variety of settings, and there appears to be direct interplay between GI leakage of LPS and inflammatory cytokines such as interleukin-6. And we have one last quote here saying that the analysis of the totality of available data shows that the components of gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria of the intestinal microflora can play an important role in the physiology and pathology of the athlete's bodies. They go on, I'm just going to read the rest of that quote there. They state, in this situation, intestinal endotoxin and dysbiosis is one of these components, possibly the active one itself. Therefore, it is advisable to use endotoxemia indicators to assess the health status of adolescent athletes. So this is something that is being studied uh, in terms of something that is going to dramatically impair recovery to exercise as well as performance during exercise, not to mention causing very, very common symptoms in terms of GI distress and cramping as well as heat stress. So this is a, an incredibly important uh, factor to consider when it comes to the performance of athletes. Now, there are a couple of reasons why the anti-nutrients are particularly problematic here. So the increased proliferation of endotoxin-producing bacteria due to lectins, along with increased intestinal permeability due to lectins and supponents, allows for significant increases in the translocation of pathogenic bacteria and endotoxin. So in other words, we have an increased production of the bacteria that produce endotoxin, and we also have increased intestinal, uh, intestinal permeability, which allows for that endotoxin that's being produced in larger amounts to enter into the bloodstream. So we see that here where we see considerable amounts of endotoxin at the top there. And because of the intestinal permeability, they're able to enter into the bloodstream and create the disastrous effects that endotoxin does. So this is why, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to come back to this 
This is why these effects of the lectins increase intestinal permeability and pathogenic bacterial proliferation. Not only are they problematic on their own, but they also all compound together to create really a disaster when it comes to uh, the capacity for performance and recovery. Now, we do have a solution here when it comes to getting rid of the anti-nutrients in the diet, and it can be a pretty simple solution. For one, we want to reduce the consumption of foods that contain high concentrations of the anti-nutrients. So this is going to be whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, and raw leafy green vegetables. And as we'll get to in a moment, there are also certain things we can do with these foods like the vegetables and grains that can reduce their anti-nutrient content. But we also have a lot of other foods that are available to us to provide largely the carbohydrate and a little bit of protein that these foods would provide and also the nutrients that these foods, while they do provide them, the nutrients are not particularly available here due to things like the oxalates and phytates. So we have some better options that we can use. This includes the foods that do not contain high concentrations of anti-nutrients. This includes ripe fruits, well-cooked roots and tubers, potatoes, sweet potatoes, parsnips, and on from there. Animal-based protein sources such as meat, seafood, dairy, and eggs. Traditionally prepared grains. So this is a situation where we can pr properly prepare things like the whole grains in order to reduce the anti-nutrients. This could include soaking and sprouting when it comes to something like oats. This could include fermentation with wheat, which could be in the form of sourdough bread, as long as it's properly fermented. And then this could also include white rice, where the bran and the hull of the brown rice are removed to create the white rice. And those components are what contain the vast majority of those anti-nutrients. So white rice is relatively low in those anti-nutrients. Then lastly, when it comes to those green vegetables, we can, instead of eating them raw, consume well-cooked leafy green vegetables and other vegetables. And so this will be, and we'll come back to uh, constructing a diet in a little bit, but can, uh, containing these foods or creating a diet that is based around these sorts of foods that are much lower in concentrations of anti-nutrients is going to be something that considerably improves performance and recovery for athletes. So that was the first nutritional factor that affects or inhibits efficient energy production. Now we're going to dig into the second, which is the polyunsaturated fatty acids or PUFA. So the polyunsaturated fatty acids are found in high amounts in quite a few foods that are often recommended as healthy. But as we'll get to in a little bit, the polyunsaturated fats are incredibly problematic when it comes to efficient energy production and therefore performance. And so we'll be digging into this and why these are foods that we're generally going to want to avoid and what foods we'll want to be including uh, in their place. It will require digging into a bit of the biochemistry here but uh, I'll try to break it down in simple terms and uh, we'll go through it step by step. But in any case, the polyunsaturated fats or PUFA are found in high amounts in most vegetable and seed oils. This includes soy, corn, canola, or rapeseed, sunflower, sesame, cottonseed, peanuts. So the vast majority of oils that are used for cooking, typically, there are some exceptions that we'll get to in a second, but these uh, vegetable and seed oils are found in high amounts in margarine, mayonnaise, salad dressing, fried foods, baked foods, and processed foods, and are also, also often used for cooking in a variety of contexts. There are certain exceptions here uh, as far as vegetable type oils or vegetarian oils that don't contain high amounts of PUFA. This is going to be olive oil, coconut oil, palm oil, avocado oil, and cocoa butter. Now, PUFA are also found in high amounts in nuts and seeds. This is going to include pretty much all nuts and seeds except for coconuts and macadamia nuts. And then we also have fatty chicken, pork, and fish as major sources of the PUFA or polyunsaturated fats, including fish oil. So again, we'll dig into in a moment here why these are so problematic and what sorts of foods we'll want to be replacing them with. All right, so the polyunsaturated fats are considerably less stable than monounsaturated and saturated fats. This makes them hundreds of times more susceptible to peroxidative damage, which drives oxidative stress and inflammation. So in other words, these oils are not very stable. They're very prone to damage. And this creates a state of oxidative stress and inflammation, which is not ideal for performance and directly impairs the capacity for energy production. So we have a chart here showing this and a quote explaining this chart. And I will read the bolded parts here. They state that this means that saturated and monounsaturated fatty acyl chains are essentially resistant to peroxidation while PUFA are damaged. Furthermore, the greater the degree of polyunsaturation of PUFA, the more prone it is to peroxidative damage. 
DHA, the highly polyunsaturated omega-3 PUFA with six double bonds, is extremely susceptible to peroxidative attack and is eight times more prone to peroxidation than linoleic acid, which has only two double bonds. DHA is 320 times more susceptible to peroxidation than the monounsaturated fat oleic acid. And we can see that depicted here in this bar graph where on the right, the omega-6 and omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids are incredibly more susceptible to peroxidative damage compared to the monounsaturated and saturated fat counterparts. And this effect, this peroxidative damage is going to directly impair the capacity for ATP production for efficient mitochondrial respiration. It's really a major problem. Now, polyunsaturated fat consumption also leads to the incorporation of the polyunsaturated fats as structural cellular components, especially in the mitochondrial membrane. So this is a situation where even if these fats are not peroxidatively damaged, they're also going to be used as uh, components of the, of the mitochondrial membrane or other membranes in the cells. They're used as structural components. So we can see this here. On the right, we have highly saturated uh, hydrocarbon tails, highly saturated membranes. On the left, these are very unsaturated membranes with high amounts of unsaturated fats. We'll explain why this is a problem in a moment. I'm going to keep going through this step by step. So when we have higher amounts of PUFA in the plasma and mitochondrial membranes, this causes permeability. This causes the leaking of electrons, protons, and sodium. And this impairs efficient mitochondrial respiration or energy production, as well as requiring energy to pump the sodium back across the membrane, which also reduces ATP availability. So what we see here is on the top, the lipid layer with very little unsaturated fat or no unsaturated fat, and there's much less permeability. And on the bottom here, we have lipid layer with very high amounts of unsaturated fats, which are very highly permeable. Now we can see the problem with that just when we go directly to the electron transport chain where we produce that ATP, where if you look closely, that middle layer there, that's a membrane that's made up of those same fatty acids. And if that membrane is highly permeable due to those unsaturated fats, all those protons, those H plus ions, which are being pumped through the first three steps of the, or first four steps of the electron transport chain from the inner to the outer mitochondrial space, that is, all, all of that pumping is going to essentially be washed out because those protons are then going to escape back through the membrane due to the permeability of these polyunsaturated fats. And so what that means is that instead of being able to use this proton gradient to produce energy, to produce ATP, the gradient is going to be dissipated. And we're not actually going to be able to produce ATP due to the presence of these polyunsaturated fats at anywhere near as efficient of a rate. Now, of course, when we're not able to produce ATP efficiently, then we're not going to have the energy for proper muscular function, among other things, which of course is going to be a problem when it comes to athletic performance. Now, in addition, we also have the permeability to ions like sodium. So as you can see here, we want to have very low amounts of sodium inside of the cell and much higher amounts outside of the cell. And we can pump that sodium from inside to outside if there's too much. And you can see the, the few steps of this here where in the beginning, the sodium enters into the channel. And then after that, ATP is used to uh, force that pro the sodium to go back out of the cytoplasm against its gradient. Now, when we have more polyunsaturated fats in that membrane there, that sodium is able to leak back into the cell and we have to go through this process over and over again, which wastes huge amounts of ATP or energy, leaving less energy available for actual muscular performance. Now, in addition to all of that wasting of energy and all of the inefficient energy production, we also have the situation of increased oxidative damage in lipid peroxide products, as we discussed, which then impairs efficient mitochondrial respiration. We've got a few quotes here describing this. The first, they state that peroxidized cardiolipin and tert-butyl hydroperoxide react with and triggers a cascade of structural alterations within cytochrome C oxidase. This is one of the components of the electron transport chain. The summation of these events leads to cytochrome C oxidase inactivation. So this is uh, step four. This is complex four of the electron transport chain. We're talking about inactivation here, meaning uh, impairment in the capacity for energy production. In this next quote, they state that dietary supplementation of EPA or DHA, these are the omega-3 fatty acids and fish oil, increases the levels of omega-3 PUFA acyl chains within the mitochondrial membranes, which leads to membrane disorganization and potentially increased electron leakage. Several studies show that an increase in the polyunsaturation of phospholipids, particularly cardiolipin, increases the production of ROS or reactive oxygen species, resulting in membrane disorganization and mitochondrial damage. 
course, these mitochondria are where we're trying to be producing energy, and the presence of those ROS, the reactive oxygen species, impairs that capacity for mitochondrial uh, respiration or energy production. And this quote states that even subtle alterations in mitochondrial function or membrane potential, such as through peroxidation, can cause a significant change in cardiomyocyte energy production. So again, just talking about small changes here in terms of uh, peroxidation, peroxidizability, creating a dramatic change in the capacity for energy production. And there are a couple other quotes here that are important to share describing similar phenomena. In this case, they state that acrolein, which is an oxidative product of specifically the omega-3 fatty acids, decreased PDH and KGDH activity significantly in a dose-dependent matter. Acrolein also interacted with, uh, with oxidized nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or NAD+, in such a way as to decrease the production of NADH. Acrolein may be partially responsible for the dysfunction of mitochondria and loss of energy found in Alzheimer's disease brain by inhibition of PDH, uh, which is pyruvate dehydrogenase and KGDH activities. So these are some of the primary enzymes that are important for producing energy. What we're seeing here is a direct inhibition in those enzyme functions as a product of the oxidized omega-3s in this case. And then lastly, they state that PUFAs induced more lipoperoxidation and cardiac cell membrane alterations than did saturated fatty acids. The lactate dehydrogenase to citrate synthase ratio was increased in PUFA rats, indicating increased glycolytic pathway relative to aerobic metabolism. In other words, instead of being able to use the carbohydrates to fully produce ATP through aerobic metabolism, the glycolytic pathway was being favored, which is not ideal for trying to actually produce considerable amounts of ATP or energy, as we know that glycolytic pathway can only support a couple minutes of muscular contraction. So it's really clear that the polyunsaturated fats are far from ideal when it comes to energy production and instead dramatically impair that capacity, dramatically impair the ability for ATP production. But of course, there is a solution here, and that's going to involve avoiding the foods that have high concentrations of polyunsaturated fats. This includes most of those vegetable and seed oils, as we described, the, the same ones that are found in those, you know, the margarine, mayonnaise, salad dressing, fried foods, baked foods, processed foods. There are a couple of exceptions that we mentioned, which will be in the low PUFA category. We also want to be avoiding the nuts and seeds with those couple of exceptions or accept those couple of exceptions and then avoiding the fatty chicken, pork, and fish. And instead, we want to be replacing these foods with the foods that have low concentrations of PUFA. So this is going to be a handful of different co uh, cooking oils like butter, ghee, coconut oil, beef tallow, olive oil, palm oil, avocado oil, and cocoa butter. It's also going to include low PUFA protein sources. This would be dairy, ruminant animal meat. So that's going to be meat from beef, bison, lamb, or goat, among other ruminant animals, uh, eggs, low fat fish, chicken, or pork. So in this case, the fat in the fish, chicken, and pork is generally high in the polyunsaturated fats, but instead we can consume low fat fish, chicken, and pork. That could be chicken breast, for example, or pork chop uh, that's relatively lean. In addition, we can have foods like coconuts, macadamia nuts, avocados, and olives. Uh, chocolate would also be one that would fall into this category as far as foods that are low in concentrations of polyunsaturated fats due to the cocoa butter being the primary fat there when it comes to chocolate. Now that brings us to the nutritional factors that support efficient energy production rather than inhibit or hamper it. And the first thing we're going to be going over here is the nutritional needs for athletes and then how we can effectively satisfy those nutritional needs. Now, when it comes to the nutritional needs for athletes in order to support efficient energy production, we or it's very important to note that athletes have increased metabolic demands and as a result, they have increased macronutrient and micronutrient needs. This quote states that many micronutrients play key roles in energy metabolism and during strenuous physical activity, the rate of energy turnover in skeletal muscle may be increased up to 20 to 100 times the resting rate. Although an adequate vitamin and mineral status is essential for normal health, marginal deficiency states may only be apparent when the metabolic rate is high, such as in athletes. Prolonged strenuous exercise performed on a regular basis may also result in increased losses from the body or an increased rate of turnover, resulting in the need for an increased dietary intake. An increased food intake to meet energy requirements will increase dietary micronutrient intake, but athletes in heart training may need to pay particular attention to their intake of iron, calcium, and the antioxidant vitamins. Now, as we talked about before, these are some of those minerals that will be that their absorption will be inhibited by antinutrients. So we want to be 
weary of that. But in general, we want to make sure that we are providing a diet that's going to meet the micronutrient and macronutrient demands for an athlete, considering they are considerably higher, considerably higher. And that deficiency is going to be considerably more prominent. And that is where the power diet comes in. So this includes a low anti-nutrient, low PUFA, high nutrient diet that's based around a handful of different food sources that we'll be discussing. When it comes to protein, this includes that ruminant, ruminant animal meat, beef, bison, lamb, and goat as examples there. It also includes lean chicken and pork, dairy, pasture-raised eggs, low-fat fish like cod, sole, flounder, haddock, mahi-mahi, and on from there. It also includes shellfish like shrimp, lobster, crab, scallops, mussels, clams, and oysters. And that will be the primary protein sources. And we have carbohydrate sources that include ripe fruits, honey and maple syrup, well-cooked roots and tubers, traditionally prepared grains like the fermented wheat, sprouted oats, and white rice that we described earlier, and well-cooked leafy green vegetables and other vegetables. And then when it comes to fat sources, we'll be focusing on co the following cooking oils. These are the ones that we described that are low PUFA, butter, ghee, coconut oil, and on from there. Low PUFA protein sources, as we described earlier in those protein sources, as well as foods like coconuts, macadamia nuts, avocados, and olives, which are all great fat sources that are going to be low in the polyunsaturated fats. Now, this brings us to our last topic here, which is going to be the environmental factors that inhibit efficient energy production. This is, and this is going to include two major categories, the first being personal care products, and the second being industrial chemicals and products. So when it comes to personal care products, there are a handful of compounds in these products that we should be concerned about. This includes the endocrine dis disrupting chemicals, which have estrogenic and anti-androgenic activities or effects, and which contributes to low energy availability and directly impairs performance and recovery. If we are in a estrogenic and anti-androgenic state, that is not ideal for athletic performance. And because of that, we're going to want to be concerned about the endocrine disrupting chemicals and personal care products, which includes parabens. This would be compounds like methylparaben or ethylparaben. It includes oxybenzone. This is found in high amounts in sunscreens where we can use something like zinc oxide or other mineral-based sunscreens instead. This also includes formaldehyde, which is surprisingly perhaps found in various personal care products. This includes fragrances, and as a uh, in contrast with choosing fragrance-based products, we can choose unscented products. This includes phthalates, which are compounds like dibutyl phthalate, dipental phthalate. We have the benzophenones. Benzophenone 1 is, is an example there. We have the bisphenols, which would be like bisphenol A, BPA. There's also BPS. And then we have PFAS, which are per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances. They often contain fluoro in their name. So we want to be considering the likelihood that these chemicals are going to be found in soaps, shampoos, lotions and moisturizers, makeups, deodorants, uh, shaving cream, sunscreen, toothpaste, cleaning products, and on from there, all sorts of personal care products. And we want to consider the fact that our exposure to these things does have and has been shown to have estrogenic and anti-androgenic effects, which is not ideal when it comes to producing energy efficiently, and performance and recovery. So these are going to be uh, important to consider. And we'll come to some solutions in a bit. When it comes to industrial chemicals and products, these there, there's a handful of different ones here that we'll be uh, looking at. The first is going to be pesticides, which have been shown to interfere with thyroid function and thyroid hormone signaling. And this directly impacts the capacity for efficient energy production, considering the importance of thyroid hormones in our metabolism. And this includes pesticides like glyphosate, paraquat, organophosphates, and carbamates. Again, we'll discuss solutions for avoiding these pesticides in a bit. In addition, we have various industrial chemicals that have been shown to interfere with thyroid function and thyroid hormone signaling. In addition to having estrogenic and anti-androgenic effects, all of these things together will directly impact our capacity or an athlete's capacity for efficient energy production and will contribute to low energy availability while impairing performance and recovery is not ideal. And this includes the following industrial chemicals, PCBs, which are found in plastics, adhesives, paint. We have perchlorate, which is found in rubber, paint, batteries. We have flame retardants or PDBEs. These are found in furniture, mattresses, carpets. We have various plastics and plasticizers 
like BPA, BPS, phthalates, acrylic, you know, and on from there. These are, of course, going to be found not only in personal care products, but any sort of plastic products, especially things like water bottles. And then we have PFAS, which are those same substances in the personal care products, but they're also found in nonstick cookware. They're found in carpets and fabrics and cleaning products. And of course, avoiding these things can be uh, potentially difficult, especially when our exposure to these is not only based on the actual products where they're being used, but also they're found in high mounts in the water supply and therefore also in the food supply. So this is another concern, but there are some solutions that we'll go over here. So to begin with, we want to be choosing organic when it comes to produce in order to avoid the high pesticide use. There is a list called the EWG Clean 15, which describes certain produce that does not actually need to be organic because there isn't very much pesticide use as it is. And beyond choosing organic products, we have some other solutions here, including opting for glass, wood, and stainless steel in place of plastic when it comes to water bottles, for example, or plastic utensils. This is a uh, pretty easy switch. In addition, we can allow furniture, carpets, and plastic products to off-gas if we're uh, exposing if our athletes are exposed to them and this is an education uh, problem where they need to know that that these products should be off-gassed prior to exposing themselves to them in addition we can use pfoa free cookware of course this is going to be very important when it comes to cooking for the athletes using filtered water this one is important as well because this is not only going to affect different contaminants in the water but also the exposure to pesticides, plasticizers, PCBs, perchlorate, all of which are found in typical water. Next, we have using healthy cleaning products without the different compounds that we've described earlier, and then using personal care products that are free of those endocrine disrupting chemicals that we described earlier. So of course, there can be some hurdles here, but the best that we can do in terms of reducing our exposure to these different industrial chemicals will really go a long way. All right, to recap, we discussed how we can maximize performance from the bioenergetic view by removing and reducing the foods that inhibit efficient energy production. This included the anti-nutrients as well as the polyunsaturated fats. And we talked about quite a few different options that we can use in place of the anti-nutrient heavy foods and the polyunsaturated fat heavy foods. We then went over providing adequate amounts of the foods and nutrients needed for efficient energy production. We discussed the power diet as the optimal solution for that. Of course, not only as a diet that is going to not have anti-nutrients in high amounts or polyunsaturated fats, but also as a diet that's going to help to meet the nutrient needs, both macro and micronutrients for the athletes considering their elevated nutrient needs. Then lastly, we talked about removing other factors in our environment that inhibit efficient energy production, including personal care products and industrial products. So that is largely going to wrap up this presentation. We do have a few slides here with the references from each of these sections and slides, including the quotes that I went over earlier. So I'll just go through those and those could be provided separately as well.